My name is uh, Colin Gordon. I'm a professor of history at the University of Iowa. Uh, our event tonight is the first event of a college-wide uh, year-long series called Pursuing Racial Justice at the University of Iowa. This is a cross-disciplinary initiative that's intended to grapple with how the university's history as a predominantly white institution has shaped the university and the college, uh, how it shaped the knowledge we produce and convey to students, um, and how it shaped the ways that uh, members of the university community interact and the relationship of the university to Iowa City and to the state of Iowa. Uh, our panel today uh, is a look at the history and the consequences of uh, racial housing segregation uh, in Iowa. And the organization is sort of roughly chronological uh, and also spatial. Uh, I'm gonna start off uh, by talking a little bit about the history of uh, race restrictive deed covenants and the way in which they were used in Iowa City and Johnson County early in the 20th century. Uh, Richard Bro from the University of Wisconsin La Crosse uh, is gonna follow up uh, with a slightly, sort of broader overview of uh, Jim Crow student housing, of segregation in student housing um, in Iowa and in the Big Ten. Uh, Kendall Larson, who's the Director of Research and Planning for the Polk County Housing Trust Fund, uh, is gonna give us a brief glimpse of her really land-breaking, uh, groundbreaking work on um, uh, redlining uh, in Des Moines, uh, which takes us into the, the sort of middle and, and uh, latter years of the 20th century. And then, uh, Jerry Anthony from the uh, Department of uh, Planning and Public Affairs at the University uh, is going to uh, carry us home with a, uh, a sketch of the patterns of uh, housing segregation uh, across the state of Iowa uh, over the last uh, generation. Uh, each of us are going to talk for between 10 and 15 minutes, uh, leaving lots of time for questions. Uh, there's a question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. Um, which will open a sort of moderated uh, question box. And some of these questions we'll try and answer uh, live uh, in the question and answer period. Uh, others will be posted uh, with the event recording. So uh, why don't we dive right in? So my work is on uh, mapping segregation in Johnson County uh, and in Iowa City. And it uh, draws on a body of research on uh, the use of racial restrictions uh, in uh, private development and private land sales uh, that became very popular at a time when uh, white homeowners, realtors, and developers were responding to what they perceived as the threat of the Great Migration as African Americans left the rural south uh, for northern cities in the early years of the 20th century. And at about this time, uh, a number of developers uh, of sort of early exclusive subdivisions, began experimenting with um, a variety of, of exclusion restrictions that they would use to uh, market those subdivisions. Uh, this restriction by race was, was sort of negotiated locally. And so on the West Coast, there were anti-Asian restrictions. In the upper Midwest, it was mostly anti-Black restrictions. There were also uh, anti-Jewish restrictions uh, and some that took in the whole uh, sort of um, ambit of, of uh, racial categories from the early years of the 20th century. But importantly, even though this was, this was done locally, it was also picked up as a basic sort of ethical standard of the emerging real estate profession that you would not and could not introduce into neighborhoods um, someone of another race. And so the race restrictive covenants themselves were sometimes attached to individual properties at sale. So if I was selling my house to you uh, and you know, I live next door, I could say, you can never sell this house to an African-American. Increasingly, they were attached to entire development. So big subdivisions would have as one of their many restrictions, a restriction on uh, racial occupancy. And sometimes in older neighborhoods, when a threat of African-Americans moving in was perceived, they would be assembled by going door to door and getting people to sign up what's called a petition covenant. These were part of a broader set of restrictions that were used in real estate in the early 20th century, because all of this is occurring before the institution of modern building codes and zoning uh, codes. So 
subdivision developers particularly use these restrictions to regulate design, what your house could be made of, where it could be put on the lot, the kind of things we expect to see in zoning and building codes today. And sometimes in the exclusive suburbs, even um, saying how much your, your house had to be worth. They typically prohibited what were deemed nuisances, that is the use of your land, uh, having a tavern, gambling, anything that produced noxious odors like a junkyard or a glue factory. And one of those nuisances was occupancy by anyone not of the Caucasian race. Here's a couple of examples, uh, one from St. Louis and one from Minneapolis, of subdivisions being marketed in this way. Uh, so all the home sites are come with these protective restrictions. And the Minneapolis advertisement uh, even spells out what that restriction is. Uh, that is, the property shall not be uh, owned or occupied by, in this case, Chinese, Japanese, Moorish, Turkish, Negro, Mongolian, Semitic, or African blood or descent. There have been a number of projects uh, around the country uh, one in Seattle, the Mapping Prejudice uh, Project in Minneapolis, uh, another one in DC, that have taken advantage of the fact that county uh, recorder's offices have been digitizing their deed records. And this makes it possible to search them in a way that we haven't been able to do before. So uh, I put together a class project with a group of history majors where we were, got access to digital copies of all of the deeds in Johnson County from 1900 to 1950, or, uh, and we narrowed that down to about 1911 to 1950. This was about 65,000 pages uh, of deed records. And because this is too big a body to read, um, and because deed records are organized in the order someone walks in the door of the deed office, and so there's no, log there's no logic to them other than buyer and seller. So we used what's called optical character recognition, that is having the computer do the reading for us and we gave it words and word stems that it should look for, like Caucasian or restriction or Negro. And uh, we also um, then checked that against the dedication of new subdivisions and against plat maps, because sometimes the restrictions was on the map of the new subdivision rather than on the deed record itself. What we found was 34 restrictive agreements in Iowa City and Johnson County, covering uh, a little over 500 residential parcels. There were 10 restricted subdivisions, uh, including University Heights, 231 parcels. So University Heights, for those familiar with the Iowa City area, was built in three stages in the 1920s, each of them containing the same restriction. Uh, Cottage Reserve uh, in, in Solon out near Lake McBride, uh, has this restriction on it, as do a number of smaller subdivisions throughout Iowa City. And then there were a number of restrictions on individual sales, most of them done by a single realtor and most of them in East Iowa City. So this would be someone who, as a matter of principle, because they dealt in this neighborhood, felt that at every sale they would restrict uh, the occupancy. The first of these in Johnson County was in 1921, the last just before they were declared unenforceable by the Supreme Court in 1947. And this is what they looked like. So this is the uh, dedication of University Heights in 1924. And here's the uh, offending clause. So University Heights is planted and dedicated for the sole use and benefit of the Caucasian race. And I like this one, uh, which is on North Dubuque Street from 1926, because this is a very uniquely Iowa City restriction. It restricts the property uh, so you cannot remove old buildings, you cannot permit a store, an oil station, a fraternity or a sorority, an apartment house, uh, no garage, no poultry, nor sale of property to Jews or colored people. We have a, a website, uh, Mapping Segregation in, in Iowa City, the uh, URL is there at the bottom of the screen, that maps parcel by parcel every one of these across Iowa City. And also, as you can see in the sort of center of the pane there, it maps uh, the, the non-white occupancy of Iowa City in 1920 and 1930. It's important to emphasize, uh, in Iowa City at least, that these restrictions were not imposed because of any sense of a threat of African-American migration. The African-American population of Iowa City did not go over 100 uh, before 1930. And so 
what most of this is, is it's really just a matter of timing. These developers were working at a time uh, in the 1920s, developing properties at a time when this was a, a core principle of real estate development to restrict and to market on the basis of that restriction. Now, as I mentioned, these were declared unenforceable by the Shelley versus Kramer decision in 1948. It didn't make them illegal to, to continue to draft them, but the state could not enforce them. But I and others have argued uh, in our research that they're carried forward and adapted and emulated in other uh, public and private policies. So in zoning, for example, often takes uh, notice of where the covenants were and replicates that with exclusive zoning. The uh, federal uh, and private systems of real estate appraisal, as, as uh, Kendall will touch on, picked up on the, this logic of segregation uh, and carried it forward in other forms of policy. And they were quite impactful. In fact, the, the deep segregation of most American cities in the North comes as a result of racial deed covenants. Cities are not very segregated in 1910. They're deeply segregated by 1940. And that, of course, also widened a longstanding uh, disparity, that is the uh, black-white home ownership gap and the black-white wealth gap that follows from that. So I'll leave my piece there and uh, pass the screen over uh, to Richard to continue the conversation. Okay, thank you, Colin. Let's see if I can get this to. Okay, so the the title of the um, pieces of information I'm going to offer up today, um, you can see there on your screen, Jim Crow Student Housing at U Iowa and in the Big Ten. Um, my, I will, for most of this, I will read portions of um, of my presentation, but I will also talk through certain portions um, just because sometimes I can I can say things more succinctly um, when I'm not when I'm not reading something. So I'll do a little bit of both uh, of those things. So on the heels of one of the largest and most deadly pandemics and to hit the United States, American cities burned. According to some sources, some 38 anti-Black riots brought destruction to neighborhoods and cities across the country. It was not 2020, but 1919. And the newly promoted James Weldon Johnson sat in the position of the executive secretary of one of the country's growing and influ growingly influential civil rights organizations, the NAACP. Johnson dubbed the late winter through the fall of 1919, the Red Summer. The name symbolized the blood of Black people spilled in America's streets as a result of racial terror lynchings, anti-Black racism, concerns about competition for work, and attempts by African Americans to organize in defense of themselves. The attacks against African Americans and their communities were not limited to the Southern United States. Chicago and Omaha were home to some of the most disturbing images reprinted in newspapers and magazines of mangled Black bodies. Anti-Black violence continued in Midwest cities like Duluth in 1920, and in 1921, whites in Oklahoma rioted, burned, and flattened the Greenwood neighborhood of Tulsa, also known as Black Wall Street. Five months after the assault on Black homes, businesses, and churches in Tulsa, Black UI student William Edwin Taylor typed a letter to the NAACP's James Weldon Johnson. You can see Taylor there in the single photo, and then Taylor is also um, in the photo here with his fraternity brothers in, in 1921. Richard, yes. Richard, could you, uh, your screen share is not working. Okay. Can you try that again? Yeah. Sorry. No. Let's see here. My apologies. Let's see. Let's try this one more time. There we go. There we go. All right. Yeah. So, um, Taylor, who you see here, um, he's 
the individual and the photo, but he's also shown here with his fraternity brothers, sought guidance and advice in matters involving an effort to prevent members of the local chapter of Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity from renting a home for its members. According to Taylor, as early as 1920, African-American students at the University of Iowa appealed to James Weldon Johnson and the NAACP to help end racial discrimination in Iowa City and within the university. William Taylor wrote that the conditions in this city are at present almost unlivable for a colored student. The attitude of hostility is felt most keenly in the matter of housing. No one will rent to colored fraternities and no one will sell in, in a livable locality. So you might remember some of the things that Colin showed us just a minute ago. Taylor reported that a local landlord broke their contract when members of the local Ku, uh, Ku Klux Klan chapter organized to outbid black students. Taylor concluded, I've been in the city long enough to note the crystallization of sentiment against us. There is an organization of the KKK here, and I have not the least doubt but that they are financing the scheme to affect our ruin. Interestingly, Johnson suggested that students contact a local or a regional chapter of the association, but refused to offer any assistance from the national office. This short presentation hopes to examine Black students' struggle to find housing at the University of Iowa, in Iowa City, and at other Iowa colleges and universities, and at a handful of Big Ten schools between the 1910s and the 1940s. Most Big Ten campuses barred African-American men and women from campus dormitories until World War II. Including in this list were the University of Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas, Illinois. Other such universities, or other such universities such as Michigan and the University of Minnesota also barred African-American collegians at least to the 1930s. Ironically, and at the same time, the University of Iowa, Iowa State, and many other flagship universities barred Black students from campus housing, small private and liberal arts colleges in Iowa allowed Black students to live in their dorms. Time constraints limit my ability to discuss developments in these institutions in any detail. However, with the time I have, let's take a look at some of the developments that occurred at the University of Iowa and in Iowa City. When Black students began to arrive in Iowa City at the turn of the century, the turn of the 20th century, they almost as a rule lived or worked at the same place or the same residence. By 1910, Iowa City had roughly about 57 Black residents divided um, between approximately nine or 10 families. Although many people lived in the southeastern part of the city, a few lived scattered through other places where there were no racial covenants. As early as 1909, when a Black man found, uh, founded a local fraternity, at least four of the six members who were enrolled lived at uh, 812 East Bloomington. The photo you see at the top is of the um, students in 1910, so you can um, you know, get a sense of who some of those students are. Um, as Black women start to enroll at the university by about 1908, they begin to take up residence with white families, sometimes with white faculty members at the University uh, of Iowa, where they worked as caregivers or maids or helped uh, to care for or clean homes. By 1917, um, the enrollment of Black students increases, and there are uh, a number of things that also happen with respect to the establishment of African American uh, national fraternities, including Kappa Alpha Psi, which was one of the earliest on campus. African American women enrolled in the university <clears throat> increased in numbers as well, and by 1917, they had traveled to Marshalltown 
to a meeting of the Iowa Federation of Colored Women's Clubs to demand that something be done with respect to housing for African-American women. By 1919, they had employed the services of the Iowa Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. And with that, they began a campaign to, uh, to, to establish student housing for African-American women that was funded by the Federation. Interestingly, there's a large campaign during this time period, and there are, um, there are attempts to get the support of the university. At best, the university only half-heartedly supports many of these measures. Um, they eventually, the federation that is, um, they eventually also lobby the governor of the state of Iowa. And through persistence of people like uh, Helena Downey, who you see, um, there's a woman seated in a chair that's Halita Downey, and uh, people like Sue Brown and other members of the Iowa Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. The campaign is eventually successful. The Federation struggles uh, quite a bit through the 1920s, and in one case, uh, Governor Nathan Kendall has to step in and forgive some of the debt. However, by the mid-20s, the home is flourishing, uh, enrollment of African Americans, both women and men, is fairly high, um, and the house was was realized. The house became a reality. The slide also shows a, a, a photo of the house. Many of you in Iowa City are probably familiar with 942 Iowa Avenue. Um, in addition, African American uh, men lived at primarily uh, two locations in terms of groups of African American students. One again was the Kappa Alpha Psi House, which was located at 301 South Dubuque. And the other was the Alpha Phi Alpha House, which was eventually located at 818 South Dubuque. And I have the founding years for the local chapters, not the national organizations on the screen as well. What is perhaps the most interesting is that those students who were not members of fraternities or sororities or who did not live in a federation home lived with local black families. And these local black families really carried the, uh, the majority of this weight. The home persists through the 1930s, the, uh, the depression hits, and then the, um, you know, the, the house struggles to stay full with students. Eventually, there are no women students who are living in the home by about 1937, and members of Kappa Alpha Psi, at least for a year, um, take over the Federation home, the Iowa Federation of Colored Women's Clubs home, and live in that home for um, at least for a year until enough women re-enroll to, to occupy the home again. To add some comparison, um, I'm not going to go over all of these, but Really at all of these institutions, um, Black Greek letter organizations played an essential role in providing housing. Often these organizations rented housing. In addition to this, African-American students challenged the uh, Jim Crow policies of their colleges and universities in a number of ways. This included the use of the local, regional, and national Black press, depending on the circumstances. And then I also try to outline some of the groups that, you know, that played a role in helping to fight against either uh, African-Americans being barred from campus housing or segregated housing or restricted housing in the respective cities that some of these universities uh, are host to. So you can see while the Iowa Federation of Colored Women's Clubs, Black alumni and Black families local black families in Iowa City played a tremendous role in supporting students at the University of Iowa and other places like Lincoln, uh, like Lincoln, Nebraska, local families helped as well. But in these cases, the NAACP and the National Urban League, the local chapters in Lincoln stepped forward to aid students in their battle against Jim Crow housing or ra uh, racial discrimination on campus. And then you can see similarly, at KU, the NAACP helps to uh, 
that helps the bolster the student fight there against racial segregation on campus and students also align with people who are uh, in uh, leftist, uh, actually socialist, um, out of Girard, Kansas, that also help them to maintain their struggle against racial segregation uh, and discriminatory practices at KU. And then uh, the University of Michigan is similar. The Michigan State Association of Colored Women plays a huge role in f helping African American women to first find housing when the university is segregated. And then along with the NAACP, NAACP helped to desegregate housing at Michigan. And finally, in the Twin Cities at the University of Minnesota, you can see that the NAACP chapter in the Twin Cities plays an important role in this. But also two of the Black settlement houses there was both the Phyllis Wheatley home in Minneapolis and the Holly Q. Brown home in St. Paul that play uh, really central roles in helping students to organize and um, fight against efforts to segregate them and to continue to bar them from campus housing. So I just offer up two examples um, of the use of the black press and students using the black press one was Doxy Wilkerson, who I mentioned um, at the University of Kansas, who, who really took it upon himself to write an editorial in the, uh, in the Crisis magazine. He worked with W.E.B. Du Bois, James Weldon Johnson, and um, Charles Wesley, who was uh, a former University of Minnesota graduate and the head of Alpha Phi Alpha during that time period to help launch efforts uh, in Lawrence, Kansas for students against racial segregation and discrimination on campus. And then at the University of Minnesota, Charlotte Crump um, is often credited with a series of editorials that were published in the Opportunity Magazine, which was the national magazine of the Urban League in helping to bring about the desegregation of campus housing and campus facilities. Interestingly, I should note that Crump was the daughter of a uh, University of Iowa alumni from 1912. The screen here offers, the screen here offers um, just a glance at when these institutions began to desegregate their dormitories. So I'm gonna sum up. Um, some of the things I've talked about in the last 15 to 20 years, colleges and universities across the United States have begun to revisit their histories related to slavery and Jim Crow. Spurred on by black and allied student protests and demands for institutional change, the names of long gone documented racists who once served as presidents, chancellors, deans of women, college deans that are permanently carved in campus buildings have given way to parks, plazas, softball fields, and dormitories that are um, named for celebrated African-American alumni and former faculty. And it seems like some of the vestiges of racism are finally being rooted out of the hallowed halls of academia. The University, the University of Iowa began this process back in October of 1972, when about 150 people gathered at Reno Hall II as it rededicated, it, uh, as it was rededicated Frederick Duke Slater Hall. 45 years after this, the university opened Elizabeth Catholic Hall. Both buildings are now named for African-American alumni who themselves could never live in dormitories on campus. Perhaps the greatest irony is that here we are over 100 years since African-American alumni and members of the Iowa Federation of Colored Women's Clubs launched their campaign for livable and safe housing for African-American women students. We sit in the midst of another pandemic. Anti-Black racism is alive and well, and we're faced with the uncomfortable decision of continuing to go backward or to listen to the voices demanding that we do the right thing and go forward. Thanks. Hello, everybody.
So uh, my name is Kendall Larson. Um, as Colin said, I'm the Director of Research and Planning from the Polk County Housing Trust Fund and we've been working on a project over the last over a year now um, called Undesign the Red Lime DSM, a localized exhibit that comes from um, a larger collaboration with a group from New York City who has this pop-up exhibit called Undesign the Red Line. Um, so today I'm just going to go through um, some history um, as well as talking about what redlining is um, and the impact that it's had on the city of Des Moines. And so, well, what is redlining? The big question. Um, but to start out with just some brief history. Um, so by 1933, which is when this is essentially developed or starting um, to be developed, the United States obviously had been de devastated by the Great Depression. And there was a huge housing affordability crisis. Um, Home ownership had been generally only available to upper middle class families um, and the mortgage lending system was exclusive before the Great Depression, which that meant that they were requiring about 50% down payments, interest only payments, and you had to repay all of that in five to seven years. So really short term amount of time to repay that. So it was really unaffordable for the kind of general American family to get into home ownership. Um, and so a lot of the homeowners um, during the Great Depression, lost their homes to foreclosure, this huge financial crisis that was occurring, um, and the mortgage lending system was essentially unraveling. Um, and so what we see is that by 1933, we have President Roosevelt coming into office, um, and he, along with Congress, is, developed the New Deal programs. Um, and these New Deal programs were social, social safety net and wealth building programs with the purpose of providing better opportunities for Americans to get out of their financial stress. And one of the ways to do that was through the mortgage lend was through mortgage lending and home ownership systems. Um, I want to point out and make sure that um, it's understood that these programs were developed only to benefit the white population. Um, Jim Crow era segregation was still very much in effect um, across all levels of government. And so they wanted to bake into all of the New Deal era programs systemic ways to cut, a, cut out people of color from benefiting from them. Um, and so in order um, to get banks out of debt and re start refinancing all these loans, the federal government decides to establish the Home Owners Loan Corporation in 1933, which essentially um, kickstarted its federal funding to revamp the mortgage lending system and get money out quickly into homeowners' hands and into the banks. Um, and then by 1934, they enacted the National Housing Act, um, which established the Federal Housing Administration, or the FHA. Um, which solidified and kind of made permanent this restructuring and revival of the mortgage lending system coming out of the Great Depression and overall the home ownership system in the United States. Um, as I mentioned before, home ownership was really only available for upper middle class families because it was so expensive to buy a home. But the Federal Housing Administration changes this with the creation of a 30 year mortgage. Um, it essentially simplified and streamlined a way across the entire U.S., across all banks and lenders, um, to get more middle-class Americans into home ownership. Um, it created, obviously, a longer-term period, 30 years, with smaller interest rates. And with these federally-backed home loans, the federal government paid sometimes up to 80% of the purchase price. So it was really, really affordable for people to get into home ownership um, and get into the American dream. But again, we have to remember that this was only for white families and individuals. Um, so because of all this refinancing of loans and the federal government putting a lot of money behind the mortgage lending system into the home ownership system, they had to find a way to assess the risk of its borrowers. And so they did that by creating these maps that we now call redlining maps. Um, and they were originally called residential security maps um, or risk assessment maps. Um, but these were maps that used color-coded system to assess the risk of the borrowers. Um, before this system, there was really no easy way to assess the risk of an individual. Um, not unlike today where we all have individual credit scores that didn't exist then um, and so they essentially created these maps to put individual to put credit scores on a neighborhood um, and so these maps were labeled a b c or d which corresponded to the colors of green blue yellow and red which then represented the lowest to highest risk 
Um, and so the green and blue areas were seen as the lowest risk areas um, where the federal government pushed more investment and increased usage of these federally backed home loans, wanting banks to put their best loans into these areas. Um, to white families. Um, and these are also the areas where we see those racially restrictive covenants and, be, and deeds being used to limit the infiltration of certain groups in these areas. Um, the yellow neighborhoods um, were termed as declining neighborhoods, um, mostly because uh, of the diversity, both in terms of economic classes, but also the ethnic and racial diversity as well. And so they were seen as higher risks. So banks were warned by the federal government to be cautious about where they were putting their money in those yellow neighborhoods and essentially only giving money and not very good loans to white people living in those neighborhoods. Then the red areas were termed as hazardous neighborhoods and they were the highest risk, um, mostly because of the quote unquote hazardous populations that lived within them. The term or phrase hazardous population includes Italians, Irish, Jews, Eastern European immigrants, Hispanic and Asian populations and African Americans. Um, and the government told banks that to, they needed to completely get out of those areas. Do not put any loans in there. Do not refinance mortgages that are already there. Um, completely get out and do not put any federal money into these red areas, these red lined areas. Um, and so what we see is that these red areas are completely cut off from investment. Um, in kind of general terms, what we see over time, the impact that these maps had um, is that the green and blue areas since the 1930s to present day have continued to see high levels of investment through loans and through city investment and revitalization compared to the yellow and red areas, which have generally not seen as much investment or no investment since the 1930s. Um, and so as we move on here, here's the city of Des Moines map um, uh, just, uh, just to show it, but there are some things that I took out from the area descriptions, which is a secondary document that comes along with the maps, uh, just to talk about what each individual neighborhood looked like and why it was given a certain rating. So you can see it talks about the D3 area where it's specifically talking about and it, the Italian race living there or the D6 area, there's a colored district. Um, and then talking about the usage of those racially restrictive covenants in the A1 and A2 areas. Um, and, you know, we really, we really see that the overall impact of this can be seen through the decades all the way up to present day. Um, we see that in the 1950s, um, there's an article there from the Des Moines Tribune in 1965, and the article states that, you know, segregation is almost 100% complete in the city of Des Moines, and that it's been really effective. Um, across the entire city. Um, so you can see that on the map there. Um, and essentially where we see the, those levels of segregation is actually where we see urban renewal and freeway construction come through in the next decade. So by 1961, sections of I-235 are being completed throughout the city and there is substantial displacement um, specifically in those African-American neighborhoods. Um, and so on kind of the left hand side of the screen, there's um, what looks like a blank neighborhood, um, but this, I'm just gonna go through a few pictures and you can see the movement of the freeway construction there, the demolition that happens um, into what happens, but you can see that an entire neighborhood and an entire area was just wiped out for an urban renewal project. Um, and so the bottom in image there is a newer image, um, satellite image, but what it's showing is that those red roads, those red markings over those roads, those are the ones that were completely blocked off and taken away um, for access to downtown. And so what we see is that a lot of those were access points for the community, for the kids to walk to downtown, for them to walk to their parents' stores, to walk to their friend's house, their grandma's house but all of those were taken away. So it limited the access. It completely kind of cut through and split through that neighborhood. We also see in the 1960s, the emergence of whites only suburbs, whites only because the FHA had conditions that homes in suburbs being built with federally backed home loans would be built would had to be built on the explicit condition that they would not be sold to black home buyers. Um, and so we see that in that quote there um, on the bottom of the screen, that is from the Des Moines Commission on Human Rights that, that really essentially nothing's being built for African-Americans in the city of Des Moines. 
Um, one of the other things that was taken away um, during this was that we call it the destruction of Black Des Moines was not only this community separation, but the destruction of Center Street. Center Street was a neighborhood that had a black business district um, and it was completely destroyed. Center Street was essentially the heart and soul of the black economy in the city of Des Moines. And all but two buildings were destroyed of this about five blocks of these businesses. Um, and that included all businesses that you can imagine, jazz clubs, pharmacies, grocery stores, et cetera. They were all destroyed and a lot of them were unable to recover. Um, and this quote unquote renewal uh, completely took away the economic center of the black community. And we've heard through stories that the levels of black entrepreneurship and black business owners today are still lower than they were back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s in the city of Des Moines. So it's very evident the lasting legacy of this um, of these policies. And so just to go through a qu few quick things here, um, kind of going into what we see today, is that we have areas of higher concentrations of African Americans in our city, you can see there on that map, um, which are, st are similar to those areas in 1950 where segregation was almost 100% complete. Um, we also see that these are the same areas where we have the highest concentration of our low income population. Um, and we also know from research that was done that black residents in Des Moines are the, the demographic group most likely to live in poverty. Um, and then also looking at things like property conditions, we see the lowest conditions being in those central areas where we have those concentrations as well as low property values um, corresponding to those poor conditions. Um, and we also see higher numbers of rental homes as well. There are also large inequalities. Uh, the One Economy Report in the state of Black Polk County that's done by the Director's Council shows that African Americans are denied loans for homes at a rate that's 2.2 times higher than the Polk County average. Um, and that's even increased since they did the report back in 2017. Um, and then looking at renters versus owners, there's a big difference. The report found that 69% of the black population rents their homes compared to 33% of the general population. And of that 69% renting, 53% are cost burden, meaning that they're spending more than 30% of their income toward rent and utilities. So over half are spending more than they can actually afford. And then on the homeowner side, with the denial of loans at such a high rate, we see that African Americans really only represent about 2.6% of all homeowners across Polk County, um, which is really low. Um, and so we also see this in how our cities continue to develop today. So over the past year, we have this new Blitz on Blight program that's been in progress. And a lot of the areas where um, we see these big sections of blight, quote unquote, are once in those redlined and yellow neighborhoods. Um, this is also um, where we see continued disinvestment occurring um, over the years and now is when the city is wanting to do something about it. Uh, so my whole question is like, why did they let it get to that point? Um, but anyway, um, we can see that the legacy is implemented even into the city's revitalization efforts because today we have um, the city of Des Moines has an organization called Invest DSM um, and they've been figuring out where revitalization should occur next. Um, and so they looked at the healthiness of these neighborhoods um, and they essentially went from the most healthy to the worst uh, health neighborhoods and they chose four neighborhoods um, and of those four neighborhoods, only, only one of them was previously redlined. Um, and so essentially what they did is that they chose neighborhoods that are still quite healthy, still seen as good, still seen as, you know, seen investment over the years. And they deliberately, uh, maybe not deliberately, but they chose to not go to the areas that has, have seen continued disinvestment. Um, and so last one of the other things I want to point out is that we've um, just finishing up here is that we've also seen this in housing development patterns. Um, so gentrification is occurring, occurring in previously redlined neighborhoods. Many of these inner neighborhoods um, are close to downtowns, which have seen increased investment and revitalization over time to draw people back to downtowns to those amenities. So now entering neighborhoods are being primed for investment, but not for the people who live there. It's for the people who can eventually afford to live there. And so we see that in the city of Des Moines with places like Sherman Hill and the East Village, where they were both areas with minority populations and low-income populations and were really affordable. 
but that has changed. They all now have market rate apartments. Uh, for instance, Sherman Hill um, has property selling upward of $500,000 um, and really high rents as well as the East Village with condos even going up to $700,000. Um, it's outrageous. Um, and so a lot of the people who once lived here I can't live here anymore. It's just so unaffordable. Um, and so we even see with the physical de development of affordable units in the city that the projects have been kept to specific areas of the city. So essentially what's happening is that those once red line neighbor in those once red line neighborhoods are still where we see um, and those yellow neighborhoods are really where we see the continuation of affordability being put, which then in return just allows for the continuation of segregation, confining low income and minority populations to certain parts of the city and they don't have opportunities to move to other areas because there's no affordability. And so just to wrap up here. Um, you know we have this big question that we're trying to work through in the city right now, which is, well, where do we go from here? We know all this history. Where do we go from here? Um, and so that's what we've been working on now um, in kind of working into our phase two after educating our community um, and really having this call to action through community engagement and creating strategies that can then be used to take the steps necessary to stop the cycle and improve our community. Um, so with that, um, I will pass it over to Jerry. Let me stop my share. Good, thanks for unmuting me. I was uh, running into some problems there. <clears throat> okay, um, thank you very much everyone for being here. Um, thank you very much for, to my colleagues on the panel. I really learned a lot from this, all three presentations, that was fantastic. Um, so my uh, little piece is on looking at trends in racial segregation in the Iowa metros. Uh, I do a lot of work on housing issues. And if you have some interest in finding out uh, more about housing, especially housing needs in the, in the state and the country, I'd be happy to direct you to some web resources that me and my team have developed over the years. But uh, getting back to the topic, the problems with racial segregation, segregation are many, and we all know that. Racial segregation has uh, negative effects on all residents, but effects on minorities are definitely, definitely much greater. And uh, we all are very concerned about our uh, educational outcomes in our public schools, but many reports have said that the best school policies are housing policies. Um, in segregated neighborhoods, people do not have access to good jobs. They are not living in places where, their people, where, um, where, where they feel very safe. They don't have access to good capital for acquiring homes or starting businesses. They often feel politically alienated and powerless. And uh, therefore, segregation, residential segregation, systematically undermines the social and economic uh, well-being of minority com communities, but definitely of the city as a whole as well. This is happening in, in, uh, in uh, Iowa City, it's happening in the state of Iowa, it's happening across the country in spite of numerous safeguards against racial discrimination. At the federal level, we have the 14th Amendment enacted in 1868 that, um, that prohibits um, racial discrimination in all areas. Uh, and um, in spite of that, uh, as we learned, we had uh, racially restrictive covenants going into place in many, many places from Colin's presentation. Uh, we had the FHA, a federal agency engaging in racial discrimination starting in 1934. Uh, and all this is happening against the background of the 14th Amendment and also in the backdrop of a couple of very key legal cases. In 1917, in Buchanan versus Worley, the US Supreme Court ruled that communities cannot have uh, racially, uh, racially charged zoning. They cannot uh, zone places based on, uh, based on uh, race. And in spite of that, so 17 years after that, the Federal Housing Administration comes along and creates these redlining maps. So therefore, um, <clears throat> the Civil Rights Act of 1968, enacted 100 years after the, uh, the 14th Amendment, uh, um, uh, in, in 1964, uh, and then amended in 1968 with the Fair Housing Act, 100 years after the 14th Amendment, clearly is focused on prohibiting discrimination and proscribing discrimination in housing and all aspects of this. 
modified a little bit to include uh, discrimination based on uh, disabilities in 1988 and familial status um, also in 1988. Uh, Iowa has a Civil Rights Act. Uh, Section 216 of the Iowa Code bans discrimination based on a whole bunch of things. Um, and you can see the, um, the Iowa Act um, was uh, very, very progressive. Um, it, has, uh, it had things uh, such as sexual orientation much before the uh, federal government started uh, uh, thinking about that. And then um, locally in um, Iowa City, Iowa City's code is uh, very, very progressive. It goes beyond the federal, goes beyond the state, provides much more, um, uh, much more um, uh, protections um, against discrimination, including as this last clause there at the bottom, um, public assistance source of income. So people who get public assistance could not be uh, discriminated against. Now, unfortunately, there was a loophole in that public assistance as defined in the Iowa City Code. The state code does not define it, okay? It does not provide this protection yet. But Iowa City Code um, provided protection, but uh, did not protect people who got housing choice vouchers from uh, discrimination till 2016. So in 2016, the city of Iowa City, uh, one of the few cities in the state, uh, expanded the definition of public assistance to include people who get Section 8 vouchers to prevent them being discriminated against um, and by, by, by landlords when they look for housing. So this project, uh, what I'm presenting today, reports on a study that I did with a few students in 2017 in advance of the 50th anniversary of the Fair Housing uh, Act. Um, we looked at the seven major metros uh, in the state. Uh, we looked at the metropolitan areas, or MSA, defined by the U.S. Census. And we looked at three different time periods, 1990, 2000, and 2010. We went back to 1990 because 1990 onwards is very good data on Hispanic uh, populations. Prior to that, Hispanics are commingled in a whole bunch of ways. Um, and also 1990 to 2000 was a period of phenomenal economic prosperity and 2000 to 2010 was not. So we wanted to compare what happened in those two different uh, time periods of economic expansion. And then we used uh, uh, something called the index of dis dissimilarity to calculate the level, at, the level of racial segregation between different people groups. There are many ways to calculate um, uh, residential segregation or measure residential segregation. Index of dissimilarity is the most intuitive, most simple, and uh, most commonly used. And we use that to look at, it's a bivariate uh, measure, so we use that uh, to look at black-white segregation, Hispanic-white segregation in the seven metros at, at different points of time, three different points at, uh, in time. Now, before I get into what happens uh, in the segregation, in uh, racial segregation, let me just paint the picture of what's happening with minority population in the U.S. Between 1990, and so on, on your screen on the top left, um, in 1990, you see that 80% um, uh, 80, 80 of the country is white, uh, but by 2010, um, it's dropped down to 72%. Uh, the black population hasn't budged much from 12.1% to 12.6% nationally, but the Hispanic population has increased significantly from 43 to 7.7%. The minority population in, in uh, Iowa has also grown, but we're starting with a very high base of white population. So in, uh, uh, in the state of Iowa, across the board, 96, 97% of the population was white in 1990. Um, and uh, in 2010, 91% of the population is white. But the black population increased, uh, went from 1.7% to 2.9%, but the Hispanic population really exploded, if you could call it that, from 0.5% to 2.3%. In the nation's largest metros, the top 100 metros, uh, you, have, you see these numbers here. Um, the uh, <clears throat> black-white segregation has been steadily decreasing, decreased across the board, uh, whereas Hispanic-white segregation increased across the board um, in the 100 largest metros. So black-white segregation went down. Um, now, the numbers you can, in the black-white panel, you can see that the highest level of segregation in any of the 100 metros was 87.4, and the lowest amount of segregation in any of the metros in 1990, black-white segregation was 31.4. You see the numbers, the, highest, the higher number going down, the lower number going down, the average going down, the median value going down. So across the board, black-white segregation decreased in the 100 largest metros in the US. Across the board, Hispanic-white segregation increased in the 100 largest metros in the US. And here are the seven metros that we took a look at. Uh, three of our metros span boundaries, the state boundaries, and we actually considered them as one for the purposes of this analysis. Um, <clears throat> uh, probably not, uh, you know, we can have questions and debates about whether that was the right approach or not, but metros are 
classified by the census as unified economic entities. So it made sense for us to look into these, even these three that cross the boundaries as well. Here's a little bit about the index of dissimilarity that we used. Um, the index of dissimilarity is a bivariate, um, a bivariate thing compares uh, one group with a reference group. Um, uh, and it ranges from zero to 100. A score of zero means there's no segregation. So if you're comparing blacks and whites, a score of zero means blacks are not segregated at all. Blacks and whites are not segregated at all. If the score is 100, it means it's uh, completely segregated. A score of say 55 means that 55% of one of the two groups would have to relocate or be relocated to other areas within that metro to achieve perfect uh, spatial integration. Now social scientists and policymakers who look at segregation say that if the index of dissimilarity score is less than 30, there's very little segregation. Perhaps there is very little systematic segregation or institutionalized segregation. Some segregation happens even if in a, in a, in a perfect world, even if there's no systematic segregation because often groups self-select. There's a self-selection, self-selection, uh, and there's a co-ethnic preference. So people might want to live next to people of the same ethnic group. So below 30 indicates there is no perhaps systematic uh, or institutionalized segregation, but above 60 shows there is very significant uh, systematic inst institutionalized segregation. And between 30 to 60 is uh, moderate levels of segregation. So I have for all seven, but in the interest of time, I'm just gonna focus on three. Um, one is Cedar Rapids. Uh, and as you can see in Cedar Rapids, uh, uh, for some reason, the right side of my panel is I can't see. I hope uh, people in the audience can see the right side of my panel. <laughs> Um, um, you can, okay, fantastic. Um, so as you can see, um, um, the, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, on the left side of the panel, you can actually see uh, the uh, distribution of the black population in 2010. And the bottom of the left panel, you can see the distribution of the Hispanic population um, in 2010. You can see the numbers of Hispanics uh, and blacks and whites in Cedar Rapids. And you can see the black and white index of dis dissimilarity scores. Um, in, in the city of Cedar Rapids. Um, so, um, uh, and so you, uh, you can see how this, uh, the trend has changed in the city of Cedar Rapids. Um, um, populations have increased, the city's population has also increased. Now, I'm um, not gonna go to Council Bluffs, let me go to um, Des Moines, since we just heard about Des Moines. Um, look at how um, uh, the left panel, look at the distribution of, uh, uh, the black population in 2010 in Des Moines. You can see the areas, there's a concentration. There are certain areas where the black populations are very, very high. There are certain pockets where more than 30% of the population within that area. Now, these areas are block groups. Um, this is provided, defined by the census. Uh, and then you can see in these block groups, certain census block groups, where there are lots and lots of African-Americans. And you can see in the bottom panel, certain places where there are um, Hispanics are concentrated. Sometimes there is an overlap, but often there is, you know, sometimes there is no overlap as well. So the high Hispanic concentration areas might not necessarily be the, uh, the, say, uh, the high black concentration areas. And you can see how the percentage of the black population has changed and the percentage of the Hispanic population has changed. And as in Cedar Rapids, you could probably see the Hispanic population has really increased significantly. Here in Des Moines, increasing by more than five or six times the population in 1990 over a very short period of time. And you can see how the index of dissimilarity has changed as well in um, uh, Des Moines. Now let me go to Iowa City. Um, again, Iowa City um, has, uh, had a, a very significant increase in the black population, but even larger increase in the Hispanic population. And um, you can see how the black white index of dissimilarity has increased and how the Hispanic white index of dis dis dissimilarity has, um, uh, has increased. Now, um, in most places, as you, in, in these three places, as you probably noticed, the first two, the black-white dissimilarity index decreased over time. Iowa City was the one where it increased. Hispanic-white, uh, um, all places increased. Uh, Iowa City also increased. So let me just go to a summary of uh, uh, what has happened. Uh, this is the black-white index of dissimilarity. Uh, this is the measure of segregation, how it has changed uh, black-white segregation, how it has changed um, in, the, in the seven cities that we looked at. So if you look at Iowa City, the index of dissimilarity, black-white segregation increased. And among the seven metro areas, it is the only metro area where black-white segregation increased over this period of time. This bucks 
you know, the, what's happening in Iowa City bucked the statewide trend, but as well as the, um, you know, the national trend also, where black-white segregation is decreasing. Um, Cedar Rapids saw phenomenal decreases. Sioux City saw phenomenal decreases. Um, and what is interesting is that um, uh, Waterloo saw a significant decrease in black-white segregation. In 1975, uh, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development did a study of segregated towns across the country. Um, across the country, they did this index of dis dissimilarity calculations. And those calculations in 1975 showed that Waterloo Cedar Falls was the 10th most segregated urban area in the country. It was the most segregated uh, for a very long time prior to 1990s. In 1990, it was, a, it was tied with Council Bluffs Omaha. Um, but both those places saw very significant decreases in segregation over this 20-year uh, um, time period, and that is very encouraging. But the other five uh, places, metro areas, are, have, have moderate levels of segregation with, uh, you know, one of them, Iowa City metro area, increasing uh, in segregation. And this is the Hispanic uh, 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 white segregation. And here, uh, in five of the seven metros, we saw an increase in segregation. Two of the metros we saw a decrease. Cedar Rapids and Sioux City are the two places where we saw a decrease in, um, uh, in um, Hispanic white segregation. So Cedar Rapids is a place where we, where we saw decreases in segregation for both black white segregation as well as Hispanic white segregation. And Iowa City is the only metro where we saw increases for black white segregation and Hispanic white segregation across, across this 20 year time period. Um, so, as you can see, the experience of the seven metro areas is, is not the same. Uh, they have had different levels. Uh, they have, they've moved in different directions in terms of black, white, and Hispanic white segregation. And the changes in terms of the amount of change has been um, uh, different. Um, why does racial segregation persist? A lot of people say it is because of co-ethnic preference, and it's really not that the case. It really isn't the case. Co-ethnic preference is actually highest among whites. There's a lot of research that shows that among all the ethnic groups, among all the uh, racial groups, whites have the greatest preference for co-ethnic co existence. Many of the other groups, African-Americans and Hispanics, um, uh, have a lesser uh, preference, lesser level of co-ethnic preference than whites. Mm. Uh, studies also show for, um, that whites are the most preferred neighbors for many other ethnic groups. Blacks, Hispanics, and Asians would love to live with um, whites. For whites, Asians are the most preferred group, followed by Hispanics. Blacks are the least preferred groups. And it all shows, it, it shows up in many, many uh, developments. Um, what really helps uh, perpetuate and uh, 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 um, propagate racial segregation is that uh, there are many, many institutionalized policies. So um, uh, that l add a layer upon personal preference and enable racial segregation to persist. So you've seen the red, uh, you know, the uh, red line maps that uh, Kendall showed. And those red line maps have been institutionalized, as Colin mentioned, in zoning policies. Um, and uh, zoning policies today don't necessarily say that these areas are for African Americans and say these are, and, and identify on a map these areas are for African Americans. They don't do that. But zoning maps show uh, and restrict where multifamily housing can be. Multifamily housing is generally occupied by low-income populations, and uh, there is a strong correlation between low income and minority status, and that perpetuates residential segregation. In many, many uh, zoning maps in, uh, across the country, if you look at uh, where the zoning maps allow residential, allow multifamily housing, you would find this very interesting phrase. Multifamily housing would be allowed in places where they serve as a barrier between single family housing and other kinds of land uses. Almost suggesting that single family housing is some kind of virginal thing that needs to be protected from all these other land uses and multifamily is an inert barrier. There are no people living there and you can put multifamily there to protect single family, residents of single family housing. You find that in many, many zoning codes, including the Iowa City Comprehensive Plan of 1997 which said that multifamily would be allowed in places where it can serve as a barrier between single family to, and other kinds of land uses. Another is that uh, funding for lower, lower price housing from, uh, from uh, federal government and most state and local governments has decreased. And we have seen an increase in private restrictive covenants uh, that 
uh, along the lines that Colin mentioned, but not necessarily based on race, but based on other things like lot sizes have to be large, uh, banning mixed income housing, banning mixed type housing. And therefore they restrict uh, the creation of housing that would be accessible for low income households, low income persons, as well as uh, for minorities. Uh, racial steering is still very common in the house search process. Um, and uh, there are racial biases in lending. Uh, my, my students and I had done a study of uh, um, racial biases in lending in the Iowa City area in 2014. This information is um, uh, publicly available, very freely available. And we found that um, African Americans, regardless of income, were systematically denied loan applications at a much higher rate than any other group. Another group that was systematically denied was women. Single women were systematically denied across races um, when they applied for uh, loan applications. And then in housing supply, there's been uh, a higher amount of housing supply for middle and upper income, less for um, low income populations. And poverty, real income has stalled and actually gone down significantly. So, um, well, um, you know, racial integration is a win win proposition for whites and non whites. And as so long as um, we don't recognize that, uh, there would be a lot of uh, opposition to um, uh, racial segregation. It's a win win proposition for whites as well. Um, and lots of information and studies um, support that. You know, in uh, 1963, Martin Luther King made his I Have a Dream speech and very dreamt that little black boys and little black uh, girls would be able to play together with white boys and white girls as brothers and sisters. They, uh, and after that came the Civil Rights Act and the Fair Housing Act. But 57 years after that speech, his dream is still a dream deferred. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> let me turn it over to um, Colin for questions and discussions. And let me stop sharing my screen. Okay. Uh, thanks. That, that was uh, that was really great, all of you. Um, I have a number of questions, uh, and a lot of them revolve around um, the ways in which this just continues over time. Because um, we have these, you know, as as uh, all of us mentioned in one way or another, we have these moments where there's a break. The Supreme Court declares one form of segregation illegal, and you know what I think a lot of housing scholars show is that you just the, the, the impulse and the uh, um, motive to segregate just mutates into a sort of another mechanism. So zoning picks up where racial covenants are take off or um, private practices of you know, racial steering or uh, denying section eight vouchers or that sort of thing pick up um, even if uh, public forms are, are, are no longer allowed. So one question is, you know, is redlining still a problem today? And you know, for me, that depends a little bit on how you define redlining. You can have a narrow definition, which is, you know, this federal system of appraisal uh, that was done in concert with the real estate industry. And, uh, you know, that went away in the late 1960s. But redlining more broadly defined, uh, that is the practices, the day-to-day -day practices of realtors and lenders and home insurers is still fundamentally with us. Um, and so I think that accounts for the persistence of these patterns of segregation. The, the one other thing, and I'll give my panelists another a chance to ch uh, jump in here, that's fundamentally important here is that the disadvantages that all of us described in different ways um, that were visited upon African-American, particularly African-American families, resulted in this a massive racial wealth gap that persists today. So um, at the median, in the middle of the distribution, African-American families have one-tenth the median wealth the white families do. And the median wealth of African-American families with children is zero. And that's a generational legacy that makes it very difficult to say, you know, you can't just change the rules and say, oh, I can move there now because you don't have that, that, you didn't get on that escalator of wealth creation when everyone else did. Um, so uh, does anyone else want to jump in on this sort of question of um, the persistence of segregation and the persistence of forms of redlining and discrimination? I'll just jump in and say that it's, 
Yeah, redlining in itself, like the actual concept that was developed in 1930 was being pushed out of the system by 1950 and by 1968, it was made illegal. Um, but even with the fair housing laws, we see that it moves from overt and explicit racist language to then being used in a way that is very behind the scenes. They're doing different things, saying different, uh, using different language to make these things still occur. Um, and that's why it's been so persistent and why this the legacy of it has been able to continue. It's this cycle that's been able to continue, not just in housing, but through all different aspects in public education um, is another one that's really linked with um, housing as well. But today we see it and we've had conversations with people in the Des Moines area specifically that, you know, we even, you know, last year someone was looking for a home and they wanted to live in a certain neighborhood that a white woman wanted to learn, live in a certain neighborhood that was seen as a not so good neighborhood. Um, and they, she was her realtor just kept pushing her to look in other parts of the city, um, saying that you don't want to live here. The schools are bad. The, you know, the properties are low valued. The, you know, you're not going to get what you want from this area. And for her, that's where she wanted to live. Um, and so she had to fight with her realtor to do that. But you can really see that people are pushing certain types of people to live in certain types, uh, certain parts of the city every single day. Um, and people are being denied uh, moving to certain parts of the city because of what they look like. Um, and that's happening today. Um, it's, it hasn't gone anywhere. And a lot of people don't realize that it is still happening on a daily basis. Um, and it, you may not see it in the language, but you can see it when they say the schools are bad. You know, there's higher crime. All of those have this association um, with certain groups of people. That's the stereotypical view that these are linked to certain groups of people. Um, and so, yeah, it just, it continues to persist because the system allows it to. I, th I mean, I think it's important to recognize that when we talk about housing, we're talking about building things that last, you know, neighborhoods, streets, boundaries. And so you change the law and you don't change the built environment. Um, so Minneapolis, for example, has, is in the process of abandoning single family home in the city, but it's not going to make a big difference because the city is mostly built up. Meanwhile, you know, Cedar Rapids or Des Moines is going in the opposite direction, right? They're up zoning more single family. Right. To, and, and also in the new zoning code um, of Des Moines, they essentially put minimum square footage um, requirements, which goes against fair housing laws, but they still put it in there because they want their they want to have higher property taxes. The city needs money, right? They need those taxes. Um, and so one of the ways to do that is to make sure that properties that are being built in infill lots um, that are now being bulldozed from the blitz on blight that I talked about, those properties are going to have to be built, you know, with over 1100 square feet, which a lot of the downtown housing in those kind of inner neighborhoods, entering neighborhoods, aren't 1100 square feet, you know, they're anywhere between 800 and maybe 1000 square feet. But those types of housing are not the priority to be built because they're lower valued properties. Um, and that's not going to get the property taxes that the city wants. Um, and we even see from the developers, the real estate developers, um, and the construction uh, people out there, they want to build those homes because people can afford them and they don't want to be building those three. I mean, they, they want to build those 300000 to $400,000 homes, but um, that's not what people are wanting now. There are a lot of people who want those smaller homes, but now the city's not allowing those to be built. There's a question that I'd like sort of Richard and Jerry to, to uh, come in on, you know, from the historical and the current uh, uh, case, and that is how does the university as an institution, you know, aside from the, its own housing, you know, the dorms, how does the university as an institution shape housing policy in the, in the wider community? What sort of leverage does it have, you know, to do good or to do bad? Well, um, I could answer from the broader sense, not specifically about student housing. Um, actually, very little. Um, uh, university faculty, staff, and students 
can point out uh, the problems with segregation in the community. And as citizens of Iowa City, we can petition our elected leaders and petition our uh, citizens, uh, our uh, civic leaders to make some changes. Uh, and uh, there are a couple of things, uh, you know, let me uh, just uh, link my response to the, the, the your comments, Colin, uh, and uh, Kendall's comments in response to the previous question. Once these things are built, once you have segregated neighborhoods, uh, because they are literally cast in stone, it takes a long time to change these things. But change can happen, especially in communities that are growing, such as, such as Iowa City. Iowa City has added a lot of population in the last 10 or 15 years and presumably will for the next, um, you know, the ne foreseeable future. As it grows, it can put in place policies that are inclusive. So the new neighborhoods as they open up will accommodate more different types of housing units. They'll have more rental, they'll have smaller uh, and a range of lot sizes. In other words, do the opposite of Des Moines, not have those minimum lot sizes, get away from it. Uh, also, um, Iowa City can provide more funding. The city can provide more funding for housing development uh, in certain areas. For example, a lot of uh, low-income housing in Iowa City, uh, minority housing in Iowa City, is uh, concentrated to south of Highway 6. Um, and one of the reasons why that happens is, um, you know, historically those were the areas that had low-income populations uh, and were less desirable land areas as well. So land prices south of Highway 6 have historically, historically been lower. So as uh, developers started building housing, especially for low-income populations, they sort of low-priced land and happened to be on the southern side, uh, south of Highway 6, and they built more and sort of reinforced that segregation. Um, Iowa City has, for the last 10 years, tried to encourage developers to build north of Highway 6. And starting about four or five years ago, Iowa City has started providing funding to bridge that affordability gap. And that's good. But it will require a lot more funding over a greater period of time to sort of have more rental housing and more minority populations um, north of 5A6. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't really hear your question, but I, um, I was having a connection issue, but I looked at the Q&A, so I think I have a sense of, of the question you asked. Um, one of the things that, that I found in my research that was a bit um, surprising to me and a bit astounding was the extent to which um, universities were in communication with each other about sort of how they dealt with issues related to um, to African American students and students of color and housing. Uh, and so, you know, you know, presidents sought advice from other other presidents um, with respect to how to handle particular situations. But the university, on whole, really just sort of left, you know, African Americans to figure the problem out themselves and often to the degree of denying even that a problem really existed in any significant way. Um, you know, there was always kind of like this deflection like, well, yeah, housing is a problem for, for, for all students or for everyone, um, not just for you. And so, you know, that, that remained the, the attitude, especially of the University of Iowa, uh, you know, for, for much, of this, much of this era of, of, um, of segregation. I, I would imagine that, you know, doing that type of research on contemporary cities that, you know, may, perhaps mayors and city councils are in conversation with each other, depending on, you know, whether you can get access to those communications, just about, you know, how, how they're, you know, they're handling, um, you know, their, their issues around things like gentrification and things like that. I don't, I don't, like I said, I don't know in terms of documentation how much is actually there, but it seems like it would be an interesting area to begin to investigate to see how much um, that's an active and ongoing conversation with respect to ways to try to maximize um, profits and, and, and with, with respect to property tax and things like that. Yeah, let me just add something to what just Richard said, um, in, and specifically in Iowa City. Uh, about uh, in late uh, 2000, so maybe 2006 or 2007, um, Iowa City, the city of Iowa City and the university uh, jointly operated a program called University uh, with the, uh, you know, instead of S, it's a C, Univer C -I -T -Y, University, where the city and the university collaborated in purchasing and rehabbing um, single family homes in neighborhoods that were transitioning and uh, redeveloping these homes, uh, rehabbing these homes, and then 
making them available to university staff and faculty. Uh, and through that, uh, I think, um, I'm, I don't know the numbers, maybe 50 to 70 homes were rehabbed and uh, they had an impact in stabilizing neighborhoods that might otherwise have uh, declined uh, in neighborhoods very close to the university in Iowa City. Uh, and then the program um, was stopped. Uh, and I think uh, you know, that, that was a very good program. So that might be one way in which the university can get back. Uh, but I don't know how the desegregation element can be brought in there. Um, I don't know. Um, but definitely it did help. That program did help in stabilizing some neighborhoods and was a really good program. A, a couple of questions uh, about the um, what we know about um, the practices of private real estate actors, uh, how those are actually regulated, um, and how you know how discrimination can still occur, you know, at the point of sale, at the point of, of getting a mortgage, despite all the protections uh, that are in place. And I think, uh, I mean, Kendall, you had an example of, uh, you know, just driving around, you don't want to live here, you don't want to live here. I mean, one thing that I think it's important to underscore that exaggerates all of this in the American setting is how closely we've, we've tied schooling to neighborhood quality. And so it, it exaggerates the tendency of people to, you know, because you're not, you're buying a house, but you're also buying access to a school district or a particular school. Um, and all of those sort of multiply the opportunities for people to, um, to yeah, you know, act on bad instincts, uh, in effect. But in, in terms of, um, you know, what's actually happening in banks and in real estate offices. Um, we've given a few, we do undesigned the red line tours um, to groups and we have done multiple groups to, we did a massive one to all of the employees of Bankers Trust, um, as well as um, a few real estate firms um, in the area um, who were interested in this because realtors do have a training course, um, like a diversity ethics training course every year where they learn what redlining is. They learn what, you know, racially restrictive covenants are. They learn what those practices were and not to do them. But what we've heard from a lot of the individuals from that world who have taken the tour is that they know of friends and colleagues who say certain things like this and they, you know, act on, uh, they kind of use this system that's just been part of the real estate world for, you know, since the early 1900s. This has just been something that realtors continue to say. Um, I didn't have it in my presentation, but we have a quote um, that's used during our exhibit tour that comes from a real estate textbook that was the rhetoric was used all the way up until the fair housing laws, but essentially it says that the colored people certainly have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but they must recognize the economic disturbance which their presence in a white neighborhood causes and forego their desire to split off from the established district where the rest of their race lives. And so this was just embedded into the ethics of the real estate community from the early times and it just continues it's just been part of the industry for so long and just been embedded in it that that's how it's grown that's how people have learned from past realtors um and so it just continues to be embedded and realtors today see it happen um and so hearing their experiences um and that they have friends and colleagues that say these things we know that it's occurring <laughs> And it's important to underscore how what a conscience, conscious invention this was, um, because um, it happens, you know, all across the color line, regardless of class. And most of the starkest restrictions early in the 20th century came when middle class African Americans were able to move into, you know, under these very restrictive mortgage rules, were starting to move into the neighborhoods because they could afford to. So it was when the doctors and the, you know, the dentists and the school teachers were moving that, that Baltimore passed the zoning ordinance in 1910. That was, that was the threat. It's also interesting. I mean, what we do know about um, real estate practices today comes from the same practices that were used in the 1960s by the civil rights movement, what are called audit studies, where you send similarly positioned uh, couples of different uh, racial groups into the same private office and see what treatment you get. 
but there was a story about this uh, in the paper just a few days ago, um, because this discrimination extends to the appraisal of, of property as well. And so African-Americans find that um, an African-American living on a street, perhaps the only African-American family, if somebody walked down the street, a private appraisal and appraised all those houses, it would get the lowest appraisal. And this was a um, mixed race couple who got a dramatically low ball appraisal on a very high end house, a half a million dollar house. So they hired, they called in another appraisal and took all the family pictures off the mantle and got a much higher appraisal. Yeah, you know, just to build off on Colin's point there, um, during this pandemic, um, the, the, during this pandemic, the, the National um, uh, Community Reinvestment Coalition conducted an experiment in which they recruited white and black subjects and uh, uh, told them to ask for information about loans to help keep their small businesses open during the pandemic. They went to banks and asked, could I get a loan to keep this open during the pandemic? They found that white requesters uh, received favorable treatment, were offered more loan, loan products, and were encouraged to apply for them much, much more than black requesters. So it's happening right now, right now in the financial industry. Yeah. So we're uh, getting close to the end of our time. So um, I want to take this opportunity to uh, thank the our wonderful audience, invisible to us, but, but um, uh, very thoughtful questions. I want to thank Richard and Kendall and Jerry for uh, taking the time to contribute this discussion. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, this is, I'm just sharing my screen here, part of a, um, wider uh, series of uh, events. Um, uh, there's another one uh, about next week at this time. You can go to this page uh, off the college uh, uh, main website to see the uh, full schedule of events. And if you look at this um, menu down the side here, uh, there's actually uh, readings and resources. Uh, so you can um, explore some of the things we've been talking about, some of the websites uh, that explore race restrictive covenants. Uh, I think we posted some of Richard's works there. Jerry's report is there. Uh, links to uh, Kendall's work uh, on redlining and Des Moines are there. And um, that will help us uh, continue the conversation and hopefully uh, make positive change. So uh, thank you everybody very much.